nice to see all your smiling faces here today. It's great to be in person and renew some old friendships that we haven't been able to do for the last three years. So uh, a special welcome. Uh, for those that don't know me, I am Bob Browner. I'm the president of the United Leukodystrophy Foundation. Uh, and I really want to welcome you to the 40th anniversary of the ULF. Yep. Ann and Hugo Moser started uh, this foundation in collaboration with Greg and Carolyn Huffer 40 years ago, and it's been a great run since then. So we as a group are excited to continue the work that was started 40 years ago and continue on for another 40 years. Maybe by then we'll have a cure for all our leukodystrophies and we won't have to do anything. We can just meet and have a party, how about that? So uh, one thing I want to remind everyone that uh, we have our gala tonight, uh, honor Ann Moser, uh, for, especially for all of her work that she is still doing for all of us, and also to kind of celebrate the 40th anniversary. But Ann's is really the main focus tonight. Uh, we do have a very limited number of tickets available for purchase, so you can go to the registration desk. We need the, that to happen like around 10 o'clock by 10 o'clock this morning, because we have to get those numbers, and the choices that are left are vegetarian and chicken. So that, that, that'll help you a little bit. Um, one other announcement that I had was uh, Kent Richter has so graciously offered availability to his room for those that uh, need a roll-in shower. So he's in room one. 11, 11, and 11, 12. I don't know if Kent's in here yet. I do not see him. Uh, his, you can call him and set up a time to do this. So I uh, got a pen and paper handy. I'll give you his phone number. He said, call him anytime. It's 352-321-0362. That number again, 352-321-0362. 6-2. So that's, that's, Kent's just been a great person to offer that. So I know there's some that may need that service. Uh, auction items. If you have broad auction items, you can bring those to the outside the door. We have a table there where we're registering those items. So bring those as soon as you can. You can see we've started setting up uh, some of the silent auction items. We will have an auction tonight after we have our program at the gala. So bring your checkbooks and bid high because I know there's gonna be some people that I'm gonna pick on. So if you get your hands up, I won't have to pick on anybody. So do that. Uh, the auction will close Saturday noon and then you'll need to pick up and pay for your items. We do not ship the items, so if you are on a flight and you buy a bottle of wine, you m we may want to just open it and we'll share it with e each other. So and I'm, I'm always happy to help. So just so, just so you know. Um, OK, uh, let's see. Another thing that uh, I really wanted to stress, you know, we've had, a, had the challenge of COVID. And you know, one of our requirements to come here was uh, mask wearing and vaccination. So I appreciate all those that have done the effort of wearing a mask so far. And so we, we appreciate that. And we're doing that for our kids. Uh, we don't want to, we want to do our best that we can do. So we don't, uh, uh, spread it if possible, but we all know that with COVID anything is possible. So we just want to do the best we can. So I appreciate everyone that's uh, doing that. Um, I know we got some people here that are new to the conference this year. So if we have some first time people that have never been here before, we'd love to have you stand and just be recognized. That way we can reach out to you as well. Here we go. We got, all right. Welcome. We are, we will be looking for you, uh, and, uh, feel free. Everybody here is approachable. So that's the, that's the best part. Your board of directors, uh, who are in, introduced here shortly, uh, will be a great resource person. And most of you have probably already met Tara. 
uh, at the registration. She's our go-to person, and sh she'll have a very short talk, uh, and then any questions they have afterwards, you can stop by and ask her. Um, I think uh, now I'm going to have the board of directors of the UOF come up here, and I'm going to have them self-introduce themselves, so if they want to just come up on the stage and we'll pass uh, this uh, microphone around, and then we can get this meeting started. The one thing that you're noticing when you walk, see them walking up here that every the board all has blue shirts it makes us easier for you to identify who we are today and feel free to ask any questions that you might have of them so if you in most cases we can a answer them uh all of our rooms for our meetings today are right down this hallway in this room here so they're just there's a name tag on each one of the rooms and they'll say united luca district foundation so you know you're right the right room so that's uh, the biggest key. So I think now that I will let the board introduce them each other, and we'll go from there. That, that's okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Savan Rudnick. I'm from Minnesota. Um, ALD and AMN run in my family. And I think we also were going to highlight a little bit about the committees that we're involved with. So there's a couple that I'm on, but one that I'd like to highlight is the communication, the conference, I guess that's two. But the reason that we're also mentioning the committees that we're on is we want to invite the ULF community to participate. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be just the board members, right? We've got, we have our thoughts, but we'd love to hear from you. And so for those that are curious, well, what's the time commitment, Saman? Like, what am I signing up for? I would say that it can be a little bit up to you, right, in terms of how much time you have. Um, maybe it would be a quarterly, you'd attend a quarterly meeting with us, provide some ideas, but ultimately we're looking for people that can also help contribute with some action items, but they'd be very easy. So we welcome you and you can email the, the office, ULF, office, what's the email? Office at ULF.com if you're interested. Org, sorry next all right hi i'm shannon reed i'm from texas our family was affected by uh an early onset leukodystrophy related to the acer 3 gene um and again we're just inviting you to help and and just really join our family um some of the the things that are really um important and what i'm passionate about is helping the newly diagnosed families um when we were newly diagnosed the ulf was so vital to our family and just getting connected. Um, so one of the committees that I'm part of is just the patient support and engagement. So if you would like any information about that or you'd like to help out, please reach out to us. Again, we're in blue shirts. Come say hi, introduce yourself. Um, we'd love to meet and just get connected with everybody. Hi, good morning. I'm Ron Shaplo. I'm the vice president of the ULF. I've been coming to the conference since the glory days of 2001 in DeKalb. I've been part of the board since 2007 and the VP since 2014. Uh, thanks for braving the challenges of traveling. I hopefully will be joined at some point in time by a son and a wife, although they're on their third delay at the airport. So that's, that's looking sketchy at best at now. Uh, and hopefully I'll be joined by my luggage at some point in time, but that's looking less promising. Um, I'm part of the fundraising committee, uh, as well as the communications committee. I am the international component from the distant land of Canada. Uh, some of you probably have heard of it. Um, and welcome once again. Thanks for coming. I know it's a challenge. My name is Joe Hasia. I'm a geneticist on the faculty of the University of Southern California. And uh, I'm involved in a medical education committee with the, with the ULF, and I've uh, been working on leukodystrophy related research for the past 15 years. In fact, I was introduced to the field by um, Ann Mosier, who uh, invited me to a ULF conference around 15 years ago when it was held in DeKalb. And I think that our hotel accommodations are a little bit better for those who <laughs> might recall the Best Western. Uh, so uh, I am grateful to, to be here. I love you all. And I look forward to uh, meeting all the new folks who are here today. And good morning. My name is Dana Skvirut. I'm United Luca Dystrophy Foundation treasurer. And I am also on part of the conference committee, part of the fundraising committee. 
And uh, so, oh, where I'm from, I'm from Illinois. And the type of the leukodystrophy that we represent is vanishing white matter, VWM. And we are very happy to see everyone in person after three years. So welcome. Hi, I'm Margaret McIntyre, and I've been part of the leukodystrophy for 14 years. My daughter has vanishing white matter, and I'm from Chicago. So if anybody has questions, just ask. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy DeMarco. I uh, was diagnosed with the leukodystrophy three years ago, and uh, ULF was one of the first uh, groups I connected with. Uh, and I have, I have Refsum's disease, which nobody had heard of, but uh, uh, I uh, started Global Dare Foundation to um, fight for a cure for Refsum, uh, but at the same time joined uh, the ULF uh, so I could understand how to run a board, how to run a foundation, and they've been a tremendous partner. And so my focus um, within the ULF is around uniting the patient advocacy groups, uh, so because we're all doing the same things, and how can we all advance uh, cures for leukodystrophies faster by working together. So. Very good. Thank you all. Uh, we do have some board members that. <laughs> we do have some board members that were unable to attend today, but uh, I'm quite sure that they're watching what we're doing today. So. Uh, Hopefully next year we'll be able to get everybody here. They're, everybody has some challenges. So uh, next, I uh, want to introduce you to the most important person that you're going to work with this weekend. So, and, and here you thought it was me. So Tara Nunez has been working for us for what, almost two years, three years? Three years. Oh, that's right, we got, that's right. Time flies when we're having fun. COVID gets you all messed up. So, all the work that she's been doing for the last uh, several months, uh, along with Keeley, until maternity said it's time to call and take a break in the, our busiest time. So I keep giving her a hard time. So anyway, uh, Tara's just got a couple things and just a couple comments. And so I will uh, let her, she's not going to talk long, I can tell you that. Hello, everybody. My name is Tara Nunez. Um, I am by far not the most important person here, um, but I will probably have a lot of answers to questions. Um, you will find me in the Red Oak foyer um, or pretty much running down the hallway. Just grab me if you have any questions about anything. Um, if you need to find a session, a room, uh, anything like that. I'm so happy that we had such a great turnout and I look forward to meeting you all. Thanks, Tara. We appreciate it and all your hard work. And the crazy thing is she's still getting people registering for the conference this morning. It's, it's been uh, really exciting to see the numbers of people that are still registering. So it's uh, it's making her job a little harder, but that's OK. She's she's good and she can she can survive. Uh, next thing I want to do is um, introduce Chris Rice, our executive director. Uh, he joined us last May. And so I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. But when Chris is finished, uh, you have your schedules. And so he, when he's done, head off to wherever you were planning on going. So we'll get there and we'll get started. Um, it's going to be just almost perfect timing. So uh, nine, basically 9 o'clock is when things will get started. So I will turn this over to Chris, and then we'll get started with the fun part of the conference. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here, to be meeting many of you, uh, obviously all for the first time. This is a new world to me, and the more I get a chance to talk to you, the, the better I can serve you. And the more you share with me what you see is the vision for ULF, the, the more likely we are to get to that vision. So please, come, give me a lecture. That's what I'm here for. Um, I, I have, have worked in nonprofits my whole life. Um, this is an exciting challenge. ULF is poised to do great things, and I'm hoping to help it get there. Uh, before I stop, I need to thank the many sponsors we have that have made this possible. 
Um, there are a lot of dedicated people in these organizations that um, care about helping patients and families. Uh, I, I am amazed by what, what they're interested in making happen sometimes because they go out of their way at, at various points. So very quickly, the organizations that helped fund this conference are Trevere Therapeutics, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Lediant Biosciences, Takeda Pharmaceuticals of America, Vigil Neuroscience, Minarex Therapeutics, Forge Biologics, Swan Biotherapeutics, Viking Therapeutics, Calico Life Sciences, Poxel SA, Affinia, Autobahn Therapeutics, Orchard Therapeutics, Passage Bio, Denali Therapeutics, and Gain Therapeutics. So give them a round of applause. So I too would be happy to answer questions, but I can bet that Tara has more answers than I do. That's just the way she is. But at any rate, please come talk to me. I hope you enjoy the conference. It, it is an amazing two days, so stay energized, pace yourself, and see as much as you can. Talk to as many people as you can. Thank you. So this is a session to recognize the progress that's being made by um, industry. So we're here to learn what they're doing and um, see, see what's next in this world. Uh, we have a fairly tight schedule, so I am going to start with our first presenter, who is Rana Dutta representing Trevere. He's the medical director of, for metabolic rare diseases at Trevere. He's been with Trevere for seven years. So Rana, if you're ready. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Chris mentioned, I am Rana Detta. I am um, the medical director for the metabolic arm for global medical affairs at uh, Trevere Therapeutics. And I, I work with bile acid disorders. So um, it's, it's, um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, what I'll do is I'll try to make this as painless as possible for you. Um, go over what we do, um, a little bit overview of our company, and also um, tell you what we're passionate about. So in terms of our company, um, some of you may, may know that we were once called uh, Retrofen. And so if we look at the ontogeny of the company and, and the name, um, essentially founded on the idea that we were, we were looking to further elucidate a compound um, within the area of muscular dystrophy. So um, as with every company, uh, we expanded, we grew, um, we diversified in various other uh, areas of, of uh, rare diseases. And so what we did was we had a name change to kind of um, better suit our interests, um, our overall interests, our passion, and our dedication to the rare disease arena. So we changed our name in uh, late 2020 um, from Retrofin to Trevere Therapeutics. And Trevere in Latin essentially stands for um, finding a new path forward. So, that being said, um, we are a fully integrated biopharmaceutical company um, within the area of rare diseases. Um, we're looking to not only identify, but also deliver, uh, develop and deliver uh, life-changing therapies to those individuals who need it the most um, within the rare disease community. Now, in terms of our focus itself, um, it's a two-fold process here. Um, one is that we have pipeline products um, in regards to our research and development and then we have commercialized products as well. And so in terms of our pipeline products, I won't go into this too much. Um, I have another slide dedicated to this, but um, we have Sparsentin for the area of nephrology. Um, we have PEG tabatinase or TBT058 for HCU or classical homocysteinuria. 
And then we have preclinical work that we're, that's being instituted um, through collaborations with research and development for NGLI-1 as well as Allergials. Now, in terms of our clinical products, there's four that's listed here. We have Thiola as well as Thiola EC, um, that being a delayed release tablet. Um, both of them are utilized for individuals who have cystinuria. And then we have Kenadol and Colbom, which fall within the area of BASDs, or bile acid synthesis defects, which are essentially um, a rare group of uh, genetically inherited disorders um, that have a single enzyme defect that leads to a deficiency in the production of bile acid, specifically kenodeoxycholic acid as well as cholic acid. And so in regards to Colbom, um, we have um, a, a product that, that essentially replaces um, uh, cholic acid for those individuals who are deficient. And then we have Kenodol, which replaces kenodeoxycholic acid, or CA, for patients who have cerebrotendinous anthematosis, or CTX. Now, in terms of partnering, it's one of our cornerstones for the company itself. Um, we pride ourselves in, in uh, partnering with organizations, so patient advocacy groups, as well as um, uh, public uh, research um, organizations as well in order to kind of move the needle forward for research and development. And then in terms of our team, um, we're not a big company. We have about 350 individuals strong in this organization. Um, we consider ourselves lean, um, mean, and very dedicated and very patient-centric uh, for, for within the rare disease community. And so we are essentially um, led by our, our president and CEO of the company, Eric Dubé, and he's headquartered at our headquarter in, in San Diego, California, and although we do have offices in Dublin, Ireland, as well as uh, Zurich, Switzerland. So when looking at our mission, um, our vision, as well as our value, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're looking for innovation. We're looking for identifying, developing, and delivering therapeutics uh, to those individuals who need it most within the rare disease community. When we look at the vision, um, our vision is to be a top biopharmaceutical company leading the way um, in the rare disease community in regards to innovation and providing hope to the patients who need it the most. And then in terms of our values, um, we consider ourselves to be very patient-centric, but also patient-inspired. And what I mean by patient-inspired is that we have our patient um, advocacy group uh, within the organization fully dedicated. Um, and we understand by talking with patients, um, the trials, the tribulations, the struggles that each, um, each of those patients go through, their caregivers, as well as their family members and friends. And that helps us inspire us to continue our, our passion within the rare disease community. So in terms of our patients, why do we do what we do? And it, re it, it revolves around our patients. That is our why. That is why we do what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so these four individuals are patients who basically came to our, um, our uh, headquarters and uh, you know, provided an, a story and our, their overviews of their trials and tribulations and their life stories about what they have to go through um, living with rare diseases that they have. And that inspires us because as a company, we have this um, occasionally and, and more frequently now um, to help us understand and really just be humble um, in terms of what we need to do. So a little bit more about our pipeline products. Um, in terms of the programs itself, we have Sparsenten, which I mentioned. Sparsenten is an area of nephrology that's being developed for FSGS, or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, as well as IgE nephropathy. That is a first-in-class um, oral single, and, uh, single uh, molecule that's dedicated to inhibiting both the ETA as well as the AT1 receptors um, that's been implicated in end-stage kidney disease, as well as loss of kidney function. We also are in development of um, CDCA in the sense of cerebrotendinous anthemosis, uh, cerebrotendinous anthematosis, or CTX, in the sense that we do have kenodol, uh, which is CDCA. But CDCA, if, since 1983 for us, has been indicated for radioleucine gallstones um, under the name of Kenex. 
And so although it's being completely utilized off-label uh, for treatment of CC CTX, it's not indicated for CTX. So two, two folds, two milestones have happened since then. One is that the FDA deemed Kinodol to be a medical necessity for the utilization of CD, uh, CTX. And second is that we received orphan drug designation um, for CTX itself. And that led to satisfying the requirements for a, a phase three clinical trial known as RESTORE. And the RESTORE study looks at the efficacy and safety of Kinodol for patients who have CTX, both adults as well as um, pediatrics. And so that's underway and it's currently recruiting. Um, we're looking to satisfy the, the obligations in order to get this approved for all those individuals who need it within the CTX community. We also have peg um, for HCU or classical HCU, which is a rare metabolic disorder that's autosomal recessive in nature. Um, essentially, they have um, uh, hyperaccumulation of a toxic um, amount of, of homocysteine, which leads to various cardinal features of the disease not only from a thrombotic standpoint, but from an ocular standpoint, as well as a developmental um, standpoint as well. And then finally, we have our preclinical collaborations that's underway uh, in terms of our discussions and research and development for both NGLI-1 deficiency as well as allergy syndrome. So one of the things, as I mentioned, we, we pride ourselves is or partnerships with organizations. And here are just a few organizations that we partner with. We have the ULF, we have the CTX Alliance, we have the ALD Alliance, we have the GFPD, Hunter's Hope, and then we have other um, ones that we partner with as well in the nephrology com community as well as others. And here is just a supporting um, the, the community um, and some of the initiatives in order to kind of champion the growth, the education, the requirements to move the needle, needle forward with, um, with the community themselves. So um, some of the support and initiatives that were um, kind of integrated into, we have the, the leukodystrophy care network, we have development of the CTX Alliance, we have unlocking the CTX patient-focused uh, drug development meetings. We have uh, development of clinical practice guidelines in regards to CTX. We have GFPD and the diversity council that we're involved with. We have the neonatal um, screening um, as well as newborn screening implementation in regards to ALD. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to thank you um, and I will pass it off to uh, Chris. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Andreas Meyer, he's the Senior Vice President of Clinical and Medical Sciences at Virg Vigil Neuroscience. Um, his, at Vigil, Andreas is hoping to contribute to the development of transformational therapies for severe neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> started his career uh, in Germany at the University of Göttingen, Germany. His residency was in the areas of psychiatry, neurology, and sleep medicine. He joined the pharmaceutical industry in 2007 and has worked on clinical development in the therapeutic areas of neuroscience, pain, and rare diseases. Dr. Meyer. Perfect. Yeah. Good morning, um, Chris. Thank you very much for the the invitation. Thank you very much for the for the introduction, and specifically, many thanks for the opportunity here for me to introduce Vigil Neurosciences to you, um, those who don't know it yet. Um, these are just our 
summary of forward-looking statements. So Vigil Neuroscience is a microglia-focused therapeutics company. Um, it is a fairly young company. It's been founded um, a little less than two years ago, um, just went public in January of this, this year. And even though it is a young company, um, it was founded with a very clear mission in mind, namely to treat rare and common neurodegenerative diseases by restoring the function and vigilance of microglia, which are the brain's sentinel immune cells. And in doing so, we see ourselves as a precision medicine-based company trying to employ like all the tools modern neuroscience drug development has available in order to hopefully sooner than later uh, being able to provide meaningful therapies for patients, their families, and, and their caregivers. What this means with regard to our current pipeline uh, portfolio is that we are deeply engaged in the development of TREM2 agonists. Um, TREM2 or triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells 2 receptor is um, a receptor which is richly expressed on microglia. It is um, essential for modulating responses to environmental signals and basically maintaining homeostasis in the brain. It is also key for the transition of microglia to the state of um, activated neuroprotective disease associated microglia or DAM. And conversely, it's been shown that um, deficiency hypofunction of TREM2 and microglia in a broader sense is um, a driver for neurodegeneration and has been implicated in, in several um, neurodegenerative conditions um, to date. So with this in mind, um, we currently have two programs in um, active programs ongoing in, in, in active development um, for this. Um, the first one here shown on the left hand side is our TREM2 monoclonal antibody um, or BGL101 which is in development for ALSP. ALSP or adult leukencephalopathy with steroids and pigmented glia is a rare, progressive, severe, um, you could say primary microgliopathy. Um, and to my knowledge so far, this is the only industry um, drug candidate at, at this time in development for, for this very severe, devastating condition. And then on the right hand side, in addition to the antibody, we also have a small molecule program currently in development. This is um, at this time in preclinical stage, is currently going through uh, IND enabling studies. And given that this has the potential to be an orally available therapy, we think that this is a very great chance and opportunity um, to be able to provide um, the microglia TREM2 related treatment for larger, broader, uh, and more common neurodegenerative conditions as well. And again, like to my knowledge, this is the only small molecule uh, agonist in development at this time. And with those two um, programs covering two different modalities, uh, we think we have a very strong basis for the successful development of microglia based therapies in the near future. And just to give you an idea practically um, with regard to our BGL-101 antibody program where we currently are, <clears throat> um, as you can see here in this Gantt chart view, um, here on the top, we are currently conducting our natural history study where we're actively enrolling patients with symptomatic ALSP and prodromal patients with ALSP. We have started our phase one study in healthy volunteers, um, first in human single ascending and multiple ascending dose um, study by the end of last year, um, looking into the assessment of safety tolerability, but also target engagement and, and other like biomarker related measures. Um, we are expecting top line data to read out like later this year. And then in the next line, uh, most excitingly, we are on track to start our first therapeutic trial in ALSP by the fourth quarter of this year. And this is something like I'm personally looking uh, very much forward to, and it will be a significant big milestone for um, 
for for the disease for for the program uh, and hopefully for make a difference for for our patients as well um, certainly um, given the broad implications of, of microglia in neurological diseases neurodegenerative conditions um, we have an interest in indications beyond um, ALSP and um, like clear considerations here are uh, genetically defined Alzheimer's disease subpopulations um, but also other leukodystrophy related uh, conditions um, specifically CALD at this time I think that's all I had brought for this quick update so um, thanks very much for for listening and I hope I could give you a very brief quick idea on like what we are doing at at visual thanks Our third, Our third presenter is Eileen Sawyer with Swan, Therapeutic, Swan Biotherapeutics. She is the Vice President for Medical Affairs. Eileen joined Swan Bio in 2021 where she leads their medical affairs activities with a commitment to serving the needs of patient and medical communities. Her expertise centers on drug development in rare diseases and gene therapy, with over eight years of experience in therapeutic areas ranging from inborn errors of metabolism in hematology and neurology. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from Emory University. So, welcome Eileen. Isn't technology wonderful, folks? Eileen is making me feel good because it takes me long to, to get any of these things done, too. Okay. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, as I commented there, the PhD is in neuroscience, not technology. Um, so I'm Eileen Sawyer. I'm really pleased to be here today um, introducing Swan Bio and telling you a little bit about where we are. So for those of you who may not have heard of us before, Swan Bio is a small gene therapy company, and we are passionate about bringing treatments um, that will be life-changing to people with devastating neurological diseases that are defined genetically. Um, we are focused on uh, building a pipeline of adeno-associated viral vector-based gene therapies, or AAVs. Our lead program um, is an AAV gene therapy in development for the treatment of adrenomyeloneuropathy, and it's called SBT101. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it on the next slide. Our hope is that by developing this treatment, we'll be able to leverage the insights that we get from developing the treatment for AMN to also then develop treatments for other disorders that may benefit from having a therapeutic gene added back into the spinal cord. So what is uh, AAV gene therapy and SBT101? So AAVs are small non-pathogenic viruses that you can use the components of to build a gene therapy vector or a method of, develop, of delivering a gene uh, directly to the patient's cells in the body. Um, so SPT101 is an AAV9 type gene therapy, which means that the capsid or that outer shell there, shown in blue, is an AAV9 type um, uh, protein shell that's basically like a package that is used to deliver the therapeutic gene cassette, which in this case contains the ABCD1 gene, um, which is the gene that's impacted in AMN, uh, to the patient's cells, where then the patient cells could be able to use that gene to produce the protein that's missing. 
Uh, this is a one-time administration, and it, the intent is that that gene cassette then stays in the patient's cells and can be used again and again to produce a long-term therapeutic effect. AAVs are, um, have actually been around for over 20 years as a class of medicine. There have been over um, 3,000, or actually much more than that at this point, patients treated with different types of AAV-based gene therapies across many different types of diseases. And this number has picked up quite a lot in the last five to seven years, as more and more of these AAV-type gene therapies have made it into clinical trials. And in fact, two of them have now been FDA approved that you may have heard of. Uh, one is called Zolgensma, which was approved in 2019 by the FDA. Um, and it's an AAV9 based gene therapy for children with spinomuscular atrophy. The other that's approved in the US is Luxterna, which is an AAV2 gene therapy for a form of inherited uh, blindness. And there are many, many other types um, that are currently in late stage development. So as I said, SWAN is working on SBT 101. Um, but before we get to being able to look at whether or not this, um, this treatment has an effect on the disease, we need to understand better what the natural history of patients with adrenomyeloneuropathy is, or really what happens with the disease when um, there is no treatment present in in the patient. Um, so we started to study about a year ago. Um, their goal is to enroll um, up to 80 patients across multiple sites in the US and Europe. And the idea is that the majority of the testing can be done at home using wireless sensors and wearable technology so that we can better understand what's happening uh, with the patient's function in their home environment and their natural environment without the burden of having to come into the clinic frequently to do tests. Um, and this will give us a comparison that we can use to better understand whether or not uh, interventions are able to uh, impact this disease trajectory. So we have um, over 30 patients enrolled to date in this study. We're approaching the halfway mark to our target enrollment, um, and that is ongoing now. Um, as we generate data from this study, we'll be sharing it with the community. We are also in the process of initiating the first in human study with SBT 101, which is called PROPEL. Um, the primary objective of this study is to assess the safety of SBT 101. Um, We're also going to be looking at what the maximum tolerable dose of SBT 101 is and whether or not there are any signs of early efficacy. Um, we'll be conducting this study in an initial small group of patients um, that should allow us to more quickly assess the key safety um, and efficacy parameters that will allow us to inform the next steps in development. Patients in this study will receive a single administration of SBT 101 and then be followed for several years afterwards. The drug will be administered one time via an intrathecal infusion. And although each patient will only receive one dose, we will study multiple doses in the course of the trial. Um, as I said, safety is one of the primary objectives here. We'll be following each of these patients very closely and assessing safety before initiating dosing of additional patients as we go forward. This study is um, now up and currently recruiting. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Come find me during the conference, or you can also email clinicaltrials at swanbiotx.com for more information. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is um, joining us virtually. It's Joel Nutel, MD with Viking Therapeutics. Joel is the Director of Research at the Orange County Research Center, where he has served as study principal and investigator on several hundred multinational cardiovascular and metabolic trials. He has had extensive experience serving the biopharmaceutical industry in the areas of clinical and academic research, as well as strategic marketing planning. 
Dr. Nutel has authored numerous abstracts, journal articles, and book chapters. He has conducted extensive research in such disciplines as cardiovascular medicine, endocrinology, and central nervous system disorders, with special attention to disease pharmacology. So, magic will happen, and you will now hear from Dr. Nutel. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Can you hear me okay, and can you see my slides okay? Uh, yes, we we can. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, and it's really a great pleasure for me to have a little opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. Um, and as you heard from Chris, I direct a um, a phase one unit uh, in Orange County, California, where we conducted all the phase one studies on this drug we're going to talk about this morning, which I think is a very novel and exciting drug for patients with adrenal myelin neuropathy. Uh, it's called VK0214 at this time. Um, I, I consult with Viking Pharmaceuticals, that's a, a, a company headquartered in San Diego, San Diego that specializes in the development of novel drugs for metabolic and endocrine diseases, and who are currently conducting studies in patients with this condition utilizing this agent. Um, so, I think, I think people uh, at this meeting are very familiar with the fact that in patients with uh, XALD, the problem that we have surrounds a family of genes called the ABCD genes, uh, which are important in encoding transporters uh, for the very long chain fatty acids into peroxisomes where they are broken down, degraded, and eliminated. And uh, we know now that when ABCD1, which appears to be the most important of this family, functions normally, you get normal transport of these fatty acids into peroxisomes, and they're broken down normally and maintain norm normal levels. When they become defective, as is the case in AL FALD, uh, that r results in a decrease in these uh, transporters for VLCFAs into the peroxisomes. And so as a consequence, they're not broken down and they start to build up in the tissues and in the plasma. And it is these very long chain fatty acids that are the villain of this disease in that they lead to disruption of cell membranes, inflammatory demyelination in brain tissue, and motor neuron deterioration. So this is our target and what we're trying to treat for the development of these new drugs. Now, VK0214 is actually a very specific agonist of a part of the thyroid receptor. Many people may wonder, well, what's the importance of thyroid in this disease? How are they connected? But it's been shown in recent years that when you stimulate the beta part of the receptor, the thyroid receptor, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a, mo a moment, it stimulates expression of other members of the ABCD family, specifically ABCD2 and also ABCD3. And the importance of this is that these can compensate for the defect of AD, ABCD1 that we see in patients with XALD, and they can also mitigate as a consequence the increase in very long chain fatty acids. And they basically substitute for ABCD1 in code proteins that allow these things to be taken into peroxisomes and broken down. So you can see there is a link between thyroid and this uh, these the family of of of, uh, of drugs. Um, so I'm sorry, I need to go back. So let's talk about thyroid hormone for a moment. Thyroid hormone, as everyone knows very well, impacts virtually every cell in our body and is very important. And given the connection with uh, what I've just said with the family of ABCD. Why is it that we haven't used this before? Well, thyroid hormone itself is really has two effects, which would be negative in patients with this disease or positive in, this patient, in patients with this disease. 
And we now know from recent studies that the receptor, the thyroid receptor, is actually divided into two parts, an alpha part, which primarily affects the cardiovascular system. So when stimulated, and obviously thyroid hormone stimulates both sides of the receptor, but when the alpha side of the receptor um, is stimulated, it has the cardiovascular effect, the prorhythmic effect, it may cause arrhythmias, it increases heart rate, which would not be a good thing to do, and also has an impact on bony and cartilaginous uh, parts of the body. So those are a problem. You don't want those things in treatment of a disease like this. However, now we know that there is another part to the thyroid receptor, which is referred to as the beta part of the receptor, and it is specifically related to lipid metabolism and metabolic control, and primarily occurs in the liver. And when you stimulate this part of the receptor, you see significant reductions in lipid metabolism, uh, decreases in LDL, decreases in triglycerides, very impressive decreases in other atherogenic proteins, and it also improves metabolic control. So when you look at this, you would say, well, can't we find something that would simply specifically stimulate the beta part of the receptor and give you all those positive lipid effects that may be very important in, in this group of patients and yet have no impact on the alpha side of the receptor, which has these potentially negative cardiovascular effects. And that's precisely what this drug that we're talking about does. It is a highly specific stimulator of simply the beta part of the receptor. And we now know from studies that we've done that it has little or no effect on the alpha part of the receptor, which is precisely what we want in the management of these patients. So you can see the importance of this thyroid part of the receptor, that the genes for adrenoleukodystrophy are regulated, it appears, by the beta part of the thyroid receptor. And when stimulated, it can induce and, and stimulate the production of these other family members of the ABCD2 genes, that, na namely ABCD2 and 3, um, which can compensate for the deficiency of the ABCD1 that we see in patients with XALD. And therefore, stimulation of this receptor, which we can now achieve, can result in overexpression of these other family members and correct the elevated, very long chain fatty acids that occur in these patients. Here you can see a study that was conducted in the fibroblasts of patients with XALD, and you can see from the slide how impressive the VK0214 is in the induction of ABCDD2 in these cells, which would, as we've talked about, compensate for any defect uh, in ABCD1. Here's another study that was also done showing that when you look at the tissue of animals treated with this particular drug, you can see expression very clearly and significantly over vehicle of ABCD2 in the liver and ABCD2 in the brain, which are precisely areas that we would need these genes in order to help with the reduction of brain and liver very long chain fatty acids. There is a good model that we frequently use in the study of drugs to assess the impact uh, and, uh, in, in patients, or potential impact in patients with XALD, and that is the ABCD1 knockout mouse model. This is about the closest model that we have to mimic the biochemical features that, that we see in human XALD. And in this model, when treated with this drug VKO214, you can clearly see from the data that it re resulted in significant decreases and quite impressive decreases of the long chain fatty acids uh, in these animals. You can see C26, C24, C22, and C20 all significantly decreased, very important. And you can see associated with that are reductions in the tissues of these very long chain fatty acids, specifically the liver, C26, 
C26 in the spinal cord, C20 in the brain, and also C26 in the brain. So it appears in this, the best model that we have to mimic patients with XALD, that we are seeing very impressive, significant reductions of these very long chain fatty acids, both in the plasma and in the tissues, obviously as a consequence of stimulating the ABCD2 and ABCD3, which have compensated for the defect in the ABCD1. I have done uh, studies, all the phase one SAD and MAD studies in healthy volunteers. As you all know, the initial studies with these sorts of drugs are done in healthy volunteers, and the data has been very impressive. Here you can see in the studies that we did in healthy volunteers, you always start these patients out in healthy volunteers, that when we looked at reductions in lipids, there were highly significant reductions in LDL cholesterol in healthy volunteers who had marginally elevated LDLs uh, when treated with this particular drug. We also looked at triglycerides, and again, you can see very impressive, up to, uh, in some cases, over 45% um, reductions in triglycerides in healthy volunteers treated with this particular agent. What was very interesting and which we've had a lot of discussions about is that when we looked at very long chain fatty acids in these subjects, which we did, and you have to remember that they start out with normal values. These are healthy subjects. They are not patients with the disease. And we all know from research that when the reductions that you see in something when you're looking at a new drug is highly dependent on the baseline level. The higher they are, the greater the reduction that you're likely to see. What was interesting about this is these patients started out with absolutely normal levels of, v of very long chain fatty acids. And despite that, we were able to show very promising reductions in these long chain fatty acids uh, in treatment um, with this drug. The encouraging thing is from these phase one studies, we found that the drug was extremely well tolerated very little in the way of adverse events, and uh, it's going to be uh, an oral agent that can be used uh, once a day in the future. As a consequence of these studies, we have started a double-blind, multi-center, placebo-controlled study uh, looking at various doses of, uh, of VK0214 uh, in, in the group of patients that are going to be studied over the period of about a month. These are adult males with adrenomyeloneuropathy, and you can see that uh, we'll probably go to higher doses depending on what we see in these initial doses, and the primary endpoint of these studies will, again, obviously, phase 1b study will to be to look at safety, tolerability, and changes in very long-chain fatty acids in these male patients with AMN. The, the study has been uh, put on a, a, a very a brief pause because we do have to provide the FDA with rodent toxicity data, which is going to be done this month, and the study will be restarted just uh, in, in the summer, just in a month or two's time, um, but I think is very promising and very exciting. If you're interested in the clinical trials of Garvin number, there it is, um, but you can see, I think, that it appears that this interaction between thyroid and these this gene family that's so important in these patients is, is very interesting, appears to be very important, uh, has been shown to be effective in animal models and in healthy volunteers. And I think it's something that is very promising or potentially very promising for the treatment of these patients in the future. And we look forward to seeing the data from these early studies so that we can take it to the, new, the next steps. So I do appreciate your attention. I hope this gives you a little idea of, of, uh, of the interesting interaction between uh, thyroid and, and now that we have a very specific uh, agonist of the thyroid receptor, how important this may be in the future management of this disease. So again, thank you, Chris, very much. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. And if there are any quick questions, I'd be happy to do it. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nutel. Our next speaker 
is William Cho, MD, PhD, Calico Life Sciences. He is the head of clinical science. Bill combines depth in neuroscience drug development with his early career experience treating patients to bring a unique perspective to the clinical science team he leads. He collaborates on bringing Calico's research into the clinic and ultimately to patients. He also provides a translational perspective to early stage researchers on their pipeline opportunities and basic research discoveries. Bill? So good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the ULF for providing this opportunity for me um, uh, to uh, represent a group of scientists at Calico and Abvi to present some progress that we have been um, uh, uh, may, making on ABVV CLS seven two six two, which is a, a small molecule. Uh, that we believe um, will have potential benefit in, in people with vanishing white matter disease. This is a, uh, a potential drug that activates the EIF2B protein. Um, and um, I will provide a, a very brief update on, on our progress. Um, many of you probably have not heard about Calico, so I just want to introduce this company briefly. It's a, it's a, we're a small to medium-sized biotechnology company that was founded in 2013 by, by Google, now known as Alphabet, and um, we've been working in collaboration with AbbVie, um, which is a, a very large, experienced global biopharmaceutical company since 2014. And um, we have a group of scientists and physicians and drug developers um, across Calico and Abvi that have been working together to, to uh, hopefully develop a therapy for vanishing white matter disease. And um, we've been engaging with the vanishing white matter co uh, research community since 2015. So, so the scientists at Calico and Abvi have been um, studying the integrated stress response, or the ISR, um, and its relationship to vanishing white matter disease. Um, the ISR is a biological mechanism whereby cells in the, in, in the body and in um, every cell in the human and other organisms responds to various types of stressors. And the two key players in, in the ISR include EIF2 and EIF2B. And these proteins come together to initiate normal protein synthesis that's required for the health of, of every cell in the body. And in, in situations of multiple types of stressors, um, the EIF2B becomes inactivated, and the inhibition of the activity of EIF2B causes the halting of normal protein synthesis, and instead, uh, an upregulation of a stress response pathway. And we believe that these proteins in the stress response pathway can help bring the cells back to a normal state of activity. So in the normal situation, this pathway is reversible. Um, but we know that in vanishing white matter disease, there are various mutations in EIF2B that decrease the activity of, um, of EIF2B. And um, this halts normal protein synthesis and increases the ISR pathway in a chronic state. And we believe that when the ISR is chronically activated, it's detrimental to the health of the cells. So the scientists at Calico and Abbey have been um, developing a series of molecules that can increase the activity of EIF2B, including mutated forms of EIF2B. Um, and, um, the discoverer of the mechanism by which these molecules increase the activity of EIF2B is Carmela Sidrowski, and she is a principal investigator at Calico. Um, and her lab has published some work uh, using a tool molecule called 2B Activator. Uh, this is a molecule that's suitable for use in, in animals, but not in humans. Um, and she's applied this um, drug to a mouse model of vanishing white matter disease that contains a mutation, one of the mutations that causes 
uh, vanishing white matter disease in people. Um, and in this mouse model, there is a decrease in the white matter or the myelin surrounding the nerve fibers in the spinal cord and in the brain. And in the normal mouse, shown on the, the panel on the left, um, you see the normal amount of, of myelin or white matter that's stained with this blue dye. Um, and in this mouse model of vanishing white matter disease, you can see that there is a significant decrease in the amount of white matter. And then when these mice are treated with 2D activator, uh, this prevents the loss of the white matter in this mouse model. So the scientists at, uh, at Calico and Abbey have now developed a, a version of this drug called ABVV, CLS7262, that is suitable for, for use in humans. Um, we've conducted initial phase one studies in healthy volunteers, and, and we've dosed more than 100 healthy volunteers with ABVV, CLS7262, across a wide range of doses. Um, the drug appears to be very well tolerated. We haven't um, witnessed any serious side effects. And this compound seems to have very good drug-like properties. Um, and uh, during the course of this healthy volunteer study, where we conducted lumbar punctures to collect some of the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, and we were able to measure concentrations of this drug um, in that fluid. And we believe that these concentrations are sufficiently high um, to, to have benefit in, in patients with vanishing white matter. So um, now I think we're ready to uh, initiate the next phase of our development. And uh, Calico, in collaboration with Abby and the Vanishing White Matter Consortium, plans to initiate a small phase 1B study um, later this year. And uh, this study will, will aim to confirm the safety and pharmacokinetics of ABVV CLS7262 in adults with vanishing white matter disease. Um, this will be an open label trial, which means all study participants will receive uh, active drug and, and nobody will receive placebo. And we plan on conducting this trial, this trial for approximately two years. Um, and because it is an early phase trial, it's a phase one trial, there may be some requirements that are uh, a bit challenging, um, including some overnight stays and, and lumbar punctures. And uh, we plan on analyzing these data early during the course of this trial, and hopefully these data will allow us to move to the next stage of development where we will uh, recruit um, a larger number of, of people with vanishing white matter disease to explore the potential clinical benefit of this drug. Um, and we're planning on doing this in collaboration with the Vanishing White Matter Consortium. So, thank you very much for your attention. Yes, now it's on. Sorry about that. Uh, let me start over again. Angela Tom is with Orchard Therapeutics. She's director of U.S. Medical Affairs. She has accountability for U.S. Medical Affairs strategy, engagement, and launch readiness. She has a passion for bringing innovative therapies to people in need. Prior to starting her career in biotech, Angela was the, a nurse practitioner for pediatric bone marrow transplant, then hemo, hemophilia nurse practitioner at the University of Arizona. Her biotech career began in field medical at Biogen, subsequently bioferative, and then Sanofi Genzyme, helping to launch two therapies for hemophilia. So, Angela. Hello. Thank you. This is my first um, ULF meeting, so uh, I'm really impressed with the scientific symposia that was presented yesterday and the international uh, 
component that was brought in uh, to Atasca. So it's been a delight to be here. I'm here representing Orchard Therapeutics, as Chris mentioned. And I'm just going to do a brief overview of Orchard and what our current programs are. So Orchard Therapeutics supports a pipeline of preclinical, clinical, commercial, lentiviral hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy programs. Uh, <clears throat> we address serious diseases where the burden is immense and current treatment is non-existent or limited. Let's see if we can. There you go. So this is our pipeline that I mentioned. In March, we did announce a reorganization of our company. And with that reorganization, we refined the portfolio to focus on neurometabolic diseases. And as you can see by our pipeline chart here, our lead program is for metachromatic leukodystrophy. With that, our priority in the US is to move towards a BLA license. So in Europe, OTL 200 for metachromatic leukodystrophy is approved for commercial use at limited centers. We at Orchard Therapeutics also have a program for MPS1H or Hurler syndrome um, that is in a proof of concept trial. And then we have additional preclinical programs for MPS3, um, ALS, FTD, Crohn's, and HAE. So as a field medical uh, professional, I focus on those that are in humans in clinical uh, trials and or in approval for the US. Related to um, the neurobiotic space, we anticipate free BLA meetings with the FDA this fall, and we anticipate filing the BLA either late this year or early next year for OTL 200. Um, we, don't, we don't have any additional updates at this time uh, in advance of our FDA filing, but I'm happy to answer specific questions related to our mechanism of action and our current programs. Thank you, enjoy your afternoon. Our next presenter um, is Maria Escolar, MD with Forge Biologics. She is the Chief Medical Officer. In addition to her role at Forge, Maria is a tenured professor of pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh and founder of the Program for the Study of Neurodevelopment in Rare Disorders at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Escalar has more than 20 years of experience as a practicing clinician and researcher and is internationally known for her work in children with rare genetic neurodegenerative conditions such as leukodystrophies and mucopolysaccharidosis. Yeah, saccharidosis. Dr. Escalar has authored more than 80 manuscripts, including two original research articles in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. She has contributed to the design of multiple trials and has been the lead investigator on many gene therapy and ERT trials. And now a presentation by Dr. Escalar. I'm Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh. I want to talk to you about FDX 101 and then We are focusing on the infantile form of Krabbe disease. Krabbe disease, as you all probably know, is due to the deficiency of galactosyl ceramidase. And this is due to a mutation in chromosome 14Q31. There are more than 160 mutations reported that can cause Krabbe disease. 
35 to 45% of the patients have 30 kilobase deletion. So a lot of the pathogenic variants are found via targeted analysis of this mutation. The infantile form presents between zero to 12 months of age in about 85 to 90% of the cases. And treated patients unfortunately die by about two years of age in average. The incidence is rare, one in 100,000, and transplant has been the standard of care. However, transplant is not curative. We're fortunate to have just 10 states right now that do newborn screening. Back in 2005, we published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine an article that showed the short-term outcomes of babies that were transplanted as neonates for Krabbe disease. Further, we continue to enroll more patients, and in 2017, we published the long-term outcomes of Krabbe. If you look at the two graphs on the right side, each line, color line, represents a patient. The gray zone is the typical population with the middle line being the 50th percentile and two standard deviations above and below normal. Uh, above you see the cognitive development. It's pretty much normal, except a few patients that are below normal, but mostly that was due to motor involvement. In the lower figure, however, you see the problem with transplant, and that is that initially you have improvement of motor skills with unfortunately a plateauing and eventual progression due to peripheral nerve disease. So while we did not find any new signs of demyelination in the brain of babies transplanted with Grave uh, as neonates, so they were asymptomatic babies, we did see this progression of peripheral nerve disease that translates into motor deficits. So transplant still improves uh, the quality of, of life and prolongs their life to their teen years. We also did a 19 year study of infantile Krabbe disease and late infantile Krabbe disease. So there are two pub different publications, one by Beltran et al., the early infantile form, zero to six months, in which we enrolled 88 patients. And then there was a second study that was done by Pasco et al., in which we had uh, 35 patients between the ages of six months and 48 months. This initial study was to really prospectively evaluate in a very standardized manner, these babies and understand what the disease progression was like. Surprisingly, we found out that patients between zero to 12 months had actually the same progression in terms of severity and similar outcomes if they were to be transplanted. So, and those are obviously patients that are not included in the, in the, in this study because they were transplanted. Uh, but what we found out is that a lot of the MRI, NCVs, ABRs, in many of these babies were abnormal, even in many infants, even before they became clinically symptomatic. The patients usually typically experience reflux and some feeding difficulties, and that's followed by irritability, then spasticity or other muscle tone changes. Um, stirring episodes are abnormal breathing, visual tracking difficulties, constipation, orthopedic complications, uh, dysautonomia, blindness, and eventual death. So that's the reason why we developed this therapy to try to improve the peripheral nerve disease. So how do we do this? So we systemically deliver a BRH10 that targets all cells in the body but has tropism for the peripheral nerve uh, nervous system. It provides also a long-term correction. Why in combination with transplant do we see an improvement? Because the transplant itself has donor cells that carry gout enzyme. There is reduced immune, immune response to the transgene because this immune system has seen the gout, and maybe even to the capsid because they are being given the treatment when the babies are myeloablated. They are also naive to AVRH10 because these cells are coming from the core blood. So as you can see here, it's being drained from the placenta, and then it's being matched to the frozen unit uh, that you would see on the right side. Also, we develop a reduced toxicity conditioning that increased survival in the Krabbe population. Up to now, it's been 100% survival. So the proof of concept studies in animals was done, and it was done first in Twitcher mice with a dose escalation study and an intervention study. Then there was a Krabbe dog model that I'll tell you more about, a rat pilot study in which we had to develop uh, the same conditioning regimen than in humans, but in rats. And this was followed by a toxicology study in rats um, that 
enabled our IND and it evaluated the safety of the profile of IPX101 using low and high doses. So IPX101 administration after transplant not only improves survival but has a synergistic effect. You can see on the left side this survival graph on the Twitcher mice. This is work done by uh, Dr. David Wenger and uh, Dr. Rafi et al. And uh, the red line shows you what happens to the affected mice. And the black and dotted line is AAV, one is BMT, so they are not significantly different if that's the only thing they get. But when you combine them, you see this synergistic effect on, on, with the blue line, improving more than 400-fold survival. So it is a dose-dependent um, effect. So you can see that in the bar graphs how with increasing dose, you get higher survival. And the other thing that was tested also by Dr. Wenger is uh, what happens is the AV treatment is early after BMT versus separated by several days. And it, we found that after 10 days, the uh, effectiveness decreases. In this graph, uh, if you look at the bar graphs in very, you know, in, in red, you see the wild type um, GALC activity in different tissues. And I would just want you to focus on the black and the, uh, and the red, and then, then the light gray, which is what happens if you give higher, like four times our target dose. So we decided to stay with the one time the dose, which is the one in black, because it's very similar to the wild type. And we have a very good effect in the sciatic nerve, which is our target tissue. On the right side, you see the different pathology slides histopathology size of a wild type, twitcher untreated, four times the AV dose, uh, and then one times the AV dose after transplant. And you can see that the wild type is very similar to the target and also to the four times, but you see the terrible edema the twitcher mice have in the peripheral nerves. And then this was then done in dogs. So here I, I am showing you the dogs, uh, the dog model that has a point mutation. It's a natural disease in dogs. The first one is um, a dog that has Crabbe and is untreated. And you can see how he develops pelvic uh, girdle weakness and it needs to be sacked at 14 weeks. Uh, that's the humane endpoint. The next slide shows you when they have AV only and this dog, while it looks better, it still has weakness in the pelvic girdle. And that one was sacked at 42 weeks. The last one, on the other hand, received the combination therapy. And this dog was sacked at 104 weeks just because this was the design of the study. But as you can see, this dog is completely healthy and was uh, neurologically evaluated before the, the dog was sacked to confirm that the dog had no signs of Crabbe disease. This work was done by Dr. Charles Speed at the University of Pennsylvania and Alison Bradbury, who collaborated with us in these uh, assessments. The next study was a rat a toxicology study in which we have five groups. Uh, one group received just vehicle, the other one received AV alone, and then we had three different doses, a low uh, target and a high dose. They received the same conditioning that was uh, designed for patients and uh, the same uh, immune suppression. So with this study, we were able to identify then what was the ideal target dose for patients by identifying the dose in which there was no toxicity in the rats. We then designed uh, the rescue phase one, two clinical trial. Again, this FBX101 product is given intravenously into a peripheral vein after hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, the period of time that we wait is anywhere from 21 to 60 days. So the there are two cohorts. The low dose is three times 10 to the 13th, and it will involve three patients. And the second cohort will have the high dose, eight times 10 to the 13th, and it will have another three patients. And this is going to be followed by two years of safety follow-up. The enrollment criteria is that they have to have diagnosis of infantile crabe, and they have to be eligible for uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. They have to be between one day and 12 months, and they have to have good organ function at the time of screening. The primary outcomes are going to be severity of adverse effects and severe adverse events that are attributed to FBX 101 and also the incidence of engraftment. 
The secondary outcomes are going to be improvement in achievement of independent seating to patients receiving transplant and improvement of gross motor function as measured by the PDMS2 above a functional age equivalent of a 12 months old by two years of age. We will have other exploratory markers where, which are usually used following in these patients, nerve conductions, auditory brainstem potential, brain MRI, cytosine reduction, and increase in gall activity. So in summary, our rescue trial provides GALC by using ADRH10 in a product that we call FDX101. It is the first systemic approach of gene replacement for patients with infantile crevice. FDX101 has the potential to correct peripheral nerve disease as we saw in the animal model. And we are very hopeful that we will see the same thing in children. We just opened a new site at the University of Michigan Medical Center. The patients seen at UPMC are going to be transitioned to uh, Michigan and the UPMC site will close. Uh, there will be additional sites opening both in the US and in Europe later this year. Um, we also uh, are planning to open additional clinical trial sites for an expanded age group. And um, I just wanted to thank um, our collaborators, both at the University of Pittsburgh and also at other universities. You see them all listed here and as well to the foundation, especially the Legacy of Angels Foundation that really provide funding for most of the preclinical work and partners for private research, as well as all families and patients that travel there for the natural history studies. Thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to present. Please feel free to reach out to me or anyone at Forge if you have any other questions about the clinical trial. Thank you, you live again. Thank you. The final presenter for the session is David E. Moeller, MD, with Poxel. He's the Chief Scientific Officer. He has extensive experience in biopharmaceutical R&D across a range of therapeutic areas. David has four years of leadership experience in biotech companies. This includes his current role as Chief Scientific Officer at Poxel a clinical stage biotechnology company pursuing new therapies for serious rare for serious and rare metabolic diseases and NASH. At Poxel, David leads R&D efforts, innovation strategy, and all aspects of scientific communications. David's past exp experience includes 20 years leading R&D efforts at Merck and Eli Lilly. So, a video presentation from David Moeller. Hello everyone, I'm David Moeller, the Chief Scientific Officer at Poxel. And it's my pleasure to share with you an update on our programs targeting X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. So let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been up to recently. We're a small European biotech company specializing in the development of discovery and developing new therapies for chronic metabolic diseases, in particular rare diseases such as adrenal leukodystrophy. I'll start by telling you a little bit about our two development candidates, PXL065 and PXL770, both of which are now in development for ALD. 065 is a modified version of the R form of pioglitazone, which is an approved drug for diabetes. In preclinical models, we've demonstrated low side effect potential, in other words, lacking the ability to produce weight gain or edema, which are associated with pioglitazone, the parent compound, and we've shown good efficacy in other diseases, as well as good activity, as I'll show you, in model systems for ALD. In the clinic, this molecule's completed phase one. We've shown good exposure to the preferred, preferred isoform of pioglitazone and very good safety so far in humans, including an ongoing nine-month study targeting liver disease. The other molecule, 770, has a different mechanism of action it's a novel mechanism called AMP kinase, which is believed to be important for a variety of diseases, including ALD. And in preclinical models, we've demonstrated good metabolic and anti-inflammatory and cell protective efficacy in different diseases, as shown here, as well as activity in ALD models that I'll show you shortly. In the clinic, 770 also has good bioavailability, once daily uh, pharmacokinetic profile, 
and we've demonstrated good human target engagement and efficacy in other diseases like type 2 diabetes and liver disease. It's very well tolerated and we have a large number of patients that have also been exposed to this molecule for up to 12 weeks in duration. Fortunately, both molecules also recently received FDA designations for work and drug status, as well as fast track designation, which may help us in accelerating the development of one of, or both of these molecules. Our initial target will be the adult form of ALD called adrenomyeloneuropathy, which as many of you know, affects men, but also women, resulting in spinal cord disease and pro progressive neurological deficits. We may also develop these molecules in the future for cerebral ALD, including potentially in children. I'll give you a quick snapshot of the data that we have with these, each of these two molecules, starting with, with uh, 065. There's a literature to support the use of this molecule, and that includes pioglitazone's effects, but even more importantly, laroglitazone, the Minorix compound, which as you know, has shown activity in animal models, as well as potential efficacy in humans with uh, uh, adrenomyeloneuropathy. Our molecule 065 is related to both pioglitazone and laroglitazone, and we believe may be an even better candidate for this disease. In the uh, model systems of ALD, we demonstrated a suppression of toxic long-chain fatty acids in cells that were derived directly from patients, as well as some mechanistic effects, such as an induction of compensatory transporters. And then in an animal model of the disease, which is the ABCD1 knockout mouse, we showed good efficacy in terms of reduction of the toxic levels of, uh, of uh, very long-chain fatty acids in the spinal cord, in the brain, et cetera. And then with the other molecule, 770, we also have a similar profile. In this case, there's an additional literature to support its potential utility, utility in ALD. And we were also able to show in patient-derived uh, cells, as shown on the left here, that we could suppress the elevated toxic levels of long-chain fatty acids with our molecule, that there was also a potential increase in the compensatory transporters that might explain this effect, and in the animal model and chronic studies, we were able to also demonstrate a significant reduction in the elevated levels of toxic uh, fatty acids in the spinal cord and the brain and so on. With both molecules, both 065 and 770, we were also able to demonstrate additional beneficial effects in the chronic animal model studies. And I'm showing you just a snapshot of those data here with 065 on the left in this case and 770 on the right in this case. So some of the effects that we saw included an improvement in the abnormal uh, uh, histology of the, uh, of the nervous system, in this case in the sciatic nerve, where you can see that neurons have an abnormal shape and potentially a functional de deficit as well. And that was basically improved or restored to normal with 065, as well as with 770. And then we did neurological tests, which included this test called the balance beam test, looking at a functional effect that is potentially correlated with uh, diseases like AMN. And here we could see also an improvement with both molecules. Our plan going forward is to take both molecules, 770 and 065, into separate but identical phase 2A proof of concept studies, beginning as soon as possible, hopefully within the next few months. These studies will include 12 to 24 patients in each study, males with AMN, no active cerebral disease, and the treatment period would be a 12-week duration. The endpoints for these studies will include pharmacokinetics, safety, but as well some biomarkers that might be relevant in terms of predicting future efficacy, such as elevated levels of long-chain fatty acids. So subject to some additional financing, our plan is to initiate both of these phase 2A studies as soon as possible, as I mentioned, within the next few months, and then to potentially advance at least one of these two molecules into a pivotal phase 3 trial uh, to begin, uh, hopefully, by the end of 2023. So we're very excited to be part of the community with Ulf and the rest of you, and we hope to be able to participate with you in advancing one or both of these molecules into development starting with both molecules in the phase 2A studies I mentioned, and then hopefully to advance into later stage development later on next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Take care. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Uh, that is the end of the session. Thank you to all our industry partners, those who presented and those who did not this year. Uh, we appreciate all the work you are doing, and it certainly sounds like there are exciting things out there to look forward to. So that's the end of the session. Bye.